Um, just one little announcement. I should have made this clear earlier. When we started the class, I promised to try to get here about 15 minutes before, and I usually do, but there's no place out here to meet with anybody. So if you're ever looking for me before class, look in the close outside. There's this little patio area that the building surrounds. I'll be out there. Okay, last time we left off um, at, uh, at Descartes' impasse, uh, the idea that, uh, the, the Cartesian idea that mind and body are somehow different, but they are somehow related, and uh, Descartes didn't have a very good, clear idea about how that relationship occurred, nor, uh, nor did anybody else. Can think about it as well in terms of James's conundrum at the end of the 19th century, he says, look, science inclines me towards materialism, uh, but uh, experience inclines me towards dualism, and uh, there must be some kind of psychophysical parallelism. There's got to be some more or less systematic relationship between what goes on in our minds and what goes on in our bodies, and maybe science will solve that at some point, though James wasn't able to do it. This problem, the, 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 the problem of the Cartesian impasse, has persisted for another hundred years, okay? Uh, so James was off in his prediction, uh, if he thought that science was going to solve it uh, quickly. And some responses to this problem are summarized in the collection of book reviews by John Searle, which I've asked you to read uh, under the title of The Mystery of Consciousness. Now, those reviews go up until about 1996 seven or eight or so, uh, and of course there's been a lot of water under the bridge uh, since then, but I'm here to tell you that it's the same water, okay? Uh, that the more recent work, in my view, hasn't really taken us any further than this older uh, work. Uh, so what I want you to do is read the Searle book, um, for, especially for those of you who have not had any exposure to Professor Searle, uh, he's quite a vigorous um, uh, writer. Um, but uh, the, the exchanges between Searle and the authors of the books he's reading give you a very nice flavor for um, what the contemporary debate looks like, in, especially among philosophers. Uh, again, this isn't a philosophy course, uh, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want you to have some sense of what's going on. So, for example, there are some people who say, look, Consciousness is just a part of folk psychology. We say we believe things and we feel things and something like that and all that, but it doesn't have anything to do with what really goes on in the machine uh, made of meat that, uh, that is the brain. Uh, then there are some folks who uh, try to do uh, the, the something materialist without engaging in reductionism, without saying consciousness is, just but, is nothing but a bunch of neuron uh, firings. Um, and then there are some people uh, reviewed in the book who try to blend uh, modern scientific materialism with a kind of dualism. They kind of try to have their cake and eat it too. Say, well, yes, the mind is what the brain does, and at some level it's all neuron firings. Uh, but still, uh, there's something important to be said for dualism. And then there are a couple of people who just out and out embrace dualism. Say, yep, they got, Descartes got it right the first time. There are two kinds of things. There are mind things and there are body things. And they're, uh, and they're very different. And then there are some, uh, some uh, folks writing in this area who just give up entirely. Uh, a good example of that is a group of people known as the Mysterians, um, uh, exemplified by a philosopher named Colin, uh, Colin McGinn. It's actually a very interesting, uh, actually a very interesting guy. But he says, you know, look, we've been trying for a long time to solve the mind-body problem. It's, so, it's stubbornly resisted our best efforts. Uh, we know that brains somehow cause consciousness to occur, but we have no idea uh, how it's going to uh, occur. And whereas Descartes thought the pineal gland was the solution, and whereas James thought, well, another 100 years or so, psychology will give us, uh, will give us this solution, um, McGinn and his fellow Mysterians think that this solution is not possible to arrive at in principle. That is, that there are certain things that are beyond our pay grade, uh, even, uh, even the smartest among us, uh, and it's simply we're never going to solve this one. 
Um, for those of you who think that's a really strange thing to say, um, uh, there are some examples of this uh, in, uh, in, in other areas of science. Uh, the psychology majors here who are uh, familiar with, um, with the uh, work of Jean Piaget, the famous developmental psychologist. Piaget had a uh, stage theory of cognitive development which argued that uh, children go through a series of discrete stages before they, uh, uh, the, before they attain adult uh, the intelligence. And one of the things that Piaget argued there was that you really can't understand uh, a formal operational thinking, for example, from the standpoint of a pre-operational child. They're simply not capable of understanding uh, the kinds of things that go on with, ab with abstract things like algebra. It's just beyond, literally beyond their ken. And what McGinn here is arguing is something very similar to that, that there are just some things that are unknowable to us. Maybe there are other creatures out there who can figure this out, uh, but, uh, but it's simply not something that's within our, uh, our cognitive capacity. When you read Searle's responses, you'll see that Professor Searle has a somewhat different uh, approach to this, a view that he calls uh, biological naturalism, in which he simply says, look, here's the solution to the mind-body problem. Consciousness is caused by the brain. That's the solution to the mind-body problem. Consciousness is just a causal property of the brain, uh, brains at certain levels of anatomical organization. We have it. Maybe some of our uh, closer animal relatives have it, like chimpanzees and dogs and, uh, and dogs and cats. Maybe invertebrates don't have consciousness. I don't know. Um, it says also, it's not just anatomy, it's also physiology. Uh, the brain produces consciousness when it's in certain physiological states. So when we're under a plane of general anesthesia, we're not conscious. When we're concussed, we're not conscious. When we're in a coma, we're not conscious. Uh, so uh, there's some combination of kind of sort of human anatomy and kind of sort of um, uh, a, um, uh, the normal physiology, and it's that that produces consciousness. Uh, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, there's a wonderful phrase um, that, that, uh, that Searle uses that I'll talk about, uh, re refer to again in a minute. And he says, look, how the brain produces consciousness is a problem for the neurobiologist to solve. Okay, and maybe they can solve it, no, maybe not, but it's not necessarily a problem for the rest of us, and the clear implication is that it's not a problem for him. Another response, one that crops up a lot in courses like this, is a, a position known as intertheoretic reduction, which is uh, generally associated with two uh, husband and wife team of philosophers, Paul and Patricia uh, the Churchland, and the program for intertheoretic reduction basically begins with the idea that natural science is the best way we have of, of describing and explaining the world, uh, and that includes uh, consciousness. Natural science is the best way we have of describing and, and explaining consciousness. And they say, look, here's how you do reductionism. When the propositions and principles of a new theory mirror the propositions and principles of an old theory, and the new theory gives better explanations and predictions than the old one, then the new theory contains the correct description of reality and is to be preferred, uh, on, the, pre preferred on those grounds. And the general idea that the Churchlands have is that um, physical science, natural science, especially neuroscience, contains the correct description of, bio of, uh, of, of mental reality. And what we ought to do is to reduce mental talk about beliefs and feelings and desires and things like that to uh, f uh, basically neurophysiological talk about neuron firings and all of that. So here, just to put it another way, that uh, the, these are basically, these are actually quotes from uh, Churchill and Churchill. Folk psychology talks about mental states. When you go home today, uh, you're going to tell your roommate how you feel and what you think and all of that. That's how we communicate with each other. Real science, their phrase, real science, talks about physical states. Therefore, they say, psychology must be grounded in the real-world findings of neuroscience. Uh, and then they go, go on to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to assert 
that uh, the world of the mind, the folk psychology of beliefs and feelings and desires and all of that, uh, is the world of ether and phlogiston and fairies and other things that people talk about when they don't know what they're talking about and don't really, uh, don't really exist. Um, now these guys actually believe this and they, um, they behave that way. There was a profile of the Churchlands in the New Yorker a couple of years ago um, in which the following exchange uh, took place. Um, uh, in which uh, Pat comes home uh, from uh, a hard day as a faculty member um, and says, Paul, don't speak to me. My serotonin levels have hit bottom. My brain is awash in glucose steroids. My blood vessels are full of adrenaline. And if it weren't for my endogenous opiates, I'd have driven the car into a tree on the way home. My dopamine levels need lifting. Pour me a Chardonnay and I'll be down in a minute. This is language, this is the interaction between two people that is grounded in the real world findings of neuroscience as opposed to, um, as opposed to philosophy. Um, and there are a couple of things that have to be said about this. The first thing is you have no idea on God's green earth what Pat is talking about unless you have a dictionary. Okay? You need to have some kind of translation uh, in terms of what's happening here. So, of course, her serotonin levels have hit bottom. That means she's depressed. My brain is awash in glucose steroids. She's kind of feeling burnt out. My blood vessels are full of adrenaline. She's ready to kill somebody. Uh, and if it weren't for the endogenous opiates uh, that, uh, that, that, that make me love you uh, and, may, uh, and uh, kick in and make me feel better, I would have done all, all these things. My dopamine levels uh, uh, need lifting. So again, you would have no idea what she talked about, what she ta was talking about, unless you already knew what the relationship was between dopamine levels and uh, mood states or between serotonin levels and mood states and all of that. Moreover, notice that they themselves can't even carry this out. Okay, so what is this Paul don't speak to me business? Okay, that is, um, uh, that, that's, uh, that's just folk psychology, right? Spe people speaking to each other. Uh, this is what happens when you speak to somebody, you know, um, and that's uh, what, what you probably should say. And this pour me a Chardonnay business. Now, that's forbidden, okay? Uh, Chardonnay does not exist in the real world of science. Uh, what, what exists is a 12.7% solution of alcohol and water and stuff like that. And you wonder why she's talking to him at all. Why doesn't she just mainline a bag of ethanol or something? Uh, in, 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 in saline and just kind of deal with it. So you know, th this is a program that, when you take it to these kinds of extremes, is exactly as ludicrous um, as, it, uh, as it sounds. Uh, moreover, I have to say, they've got it exactly backwards. Because how is it that we know that serotonin levels have something to do with, with mood states? How do you do that study? Exactly. You measure serotonin levels while people report their mood states, and then you discover that their serotonin levels have changed when their mood state changes. The self-report comes first. If you didn't know what the person's mood state was, you'd have no idea what serotonin had to do with anything. Uh, right? Yes? Are the not more with, uh, That's what this is. This it tries to eliminate Mental talk, folk psychology, all this stuff about pouring Chardonnays and speaking to people and all that, the whole point of, that, of, of, this, of this extract is to show what eliminative materialism would look like. Quick question. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. They're not giving you any more detail. There's no more understanding of what Pat feels and what she wants now than there was before, right? Um, so it, it just doesn't work on that level. Moreover, as I said before, they've got it backwards, okay, for the reasons stated here. Instead of grounding psychology in the real world findings of neuroscience, uh, what people really want to do is to ground neuroscience in the real world findings of psychology. The psychology comes first. Without the psychology, you have no idea what to make of the neuroscience. And in the history of psychology and of neuroscience, there are lots and lots of examples of this. Uh, my favorite example is color vision. 
Uh, we, can, we, we now know in exquisite detail what the, what the neurology of color vision is all about, and the receptors, and the neural pathways, and the opponent processes, and all of that stuff. But none of that would have happened had there not been an earlier psychophysics that told us what the basic colors were. Without that, none of the physiology would have been possible. Okay? And that's basically self-report. That's folk psychology. That's I see some red and some yellow when I look at an orange uh, color patch. Same thing for the structure of memory. A great deal is made about the role of the hippocampus in, uh, in uh, re re remembering events and experiences. Uh, and that's supposed to be, uh, the, the, the discovery of the, of, the, uh, of the hippocampus was supposed to be some kind of great advance in our understanding of memory. But if you trace the history of it, in fact, what you discover is that the interpretation of hippocampal functioning has tracked precisely changes in the psychology of memory. So that when H.M. first had his, uh, his, his operation and he woke up and people discovered he was amnesic, um, uh, that was in uh, 1953 or so, uh, before we had a cognitive psychology. And uh, so it was to, uh, his uh, amnesia was, was identified as a learning failure. Okay, then later on, Atkinson and Schifrin came along and distinguished between short-term and long-term memory, and HM's uh, problem was reinterpreted as one of uh, uh, long-term memory, not short-term memory. Then later on, we had the three-stage uh, uh, model of memory processing, and it was discovered that HM had a problem of retrieval, but not of, enco uh, not of encoding, a problem of declarative memory, not procedural memory, a problem of, of episodic memory, but not semantic memory. The interpretation of hippocampal functioning is always determined by a psychological theory, because the hippocampus is performing a psychological um, uh, no, no, no function uh, here. Unless you know what the function is, you can't tell me what the hippocampus is doing, leading to uh, the, uh, the, exactly the reverse of, uh, of, the, of the Churchill's idea. Uh, it seems to me that without neuroscience, psychology is still a science of mental life. If we didn't know anything about how the brain worked, uh, psychologists could still do their work at the psychological level of analysis, trying to figure out the properties of mental structure and function. But without psychology, neuroscience is just the science of neurons. You can describe the physiology of neural functioning perfectly well without knowing any psychology at all. There's you know, the permeation of uh, sodium ions with, uh, uh, through the cell barrier and the transmission of, a, of, a, of an impulse down the axon and uh, the, the three phases of synaptic transmission and all of that kind of stuff. You can do that perfectly well without knowing any psychology. But if you want to know what these neurons are doing, if you want to know what these brain structures are doing, you've got to have of the correct uh, analysis of the task at the psychological level of analysis. So anyway, enough sermon. Um, that is uh, kind of three general approaches here, just to give up, right? Uh, to kick the problem over to the neurobiologist to solve or to, um, uh, or to try to engage in some kind of, as you say, eliminative, eliminative materialism, which is what, uh, what their program uh, is. We're going to not spend a lot of time on this. What I want to do is to finish up this series of lectures by actually decomposing the mind-body problem into four quite separate problems. Okay? Um, and the, the first one, the one that gets the most attention in uh, the book of book reviews and the one that gets most attention in most treatises uh, on, on consciousness, is the standard view of the mind-body problem, which is how do you get from body to mind? That is, how do you get from brain function, from neural activity, to conscious mental states of believing and feeling and desiring and, uh, and all of that stuff? This is now being phrased as uh, the problem of the neural correlates of consciousness, and I'll say more later in this lecture to introduce that uh, uh, to you. The second mind-body problem is the reverse, which is to say, how do we get from mind to body? Remember that Descartes argued that uh, mind and body interacted. He argued for interactive dualism. We know things through our, the activity of our sensory um, mechanisms, 
Uh, but it's also the case that thoughts can control what our bodies do. The most interesting aspect of this, in my mind, uh, has to do with things like placebo effects and other psychosomatic effects where people's beliefs and feelings and desires have some effect on their bodily functioning. Now, in, in, in some level, uh, these, uh, these effects are kind of trivial. If I say, I believe, I, I, I wish to raise my right hand, and I raise my right hand, okay, that's interesting. Uh, but what we're talking about here is that something that goes much deeper uh, than that in a, in a real sense. Uh, that is, a patient's belief that he or she is taking an active medication leads, uh, leads to the kinds of, kinds of changes uh, that would be associated with that medication, even though they're taking a placebo. Uh, the effects of suggestion on various kinds of bodily processes and so on. Uh, those are the body to, uh, sorry, mind to body uh, links that I think are really interesting for a course, uh, uh, for a course like this. The third problem, or the third uh, variant on the mind-body problem, is the problem of mind without body. In the 19th century, and, that, uh, and, and again in the 20th century, and even now today, we have uh, debates over what are known as, uh, 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 over what's known as spiritualism, or in psychology, parapsychology. That is to say, whether you can have mental life without any body at all, that is, a brain at all, whether, you, whether thoughts and consciousness somehow exists out in the world independent of any particular body, uh, body or brain. The 19th century spiritualists who believed in things like ghosts uh, and precognition and, and, and all of that obviously thought that consciousness could exist in the space between brains, okay? Um, that you could have um, uh, 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 knowledge or communication between one person and another without any physical medium at all. Modern parapsychologists believe much the same thing. And there's actually a literature that continues to this day with people trying to show uh, extrasensory perception or the accuracy of mediums or uh, the, uh, the validity of precognition or whatever. And we'll talk a little bit about that as this third aspect of uh, the mind-body problem. And then finally, we'll talk uh, about uh, the problem of body without mind that is to say, bodies without consciousness, and return ourselves to uh, a problem that we discussed last time, the problem of epiphenomenalism. Uh, there, are, there are people out there who think that consciousness, we have consciousness, but consciousness counts for little or nothing in uh, the ordinary course of everyday living. That is, much the same way that Descartes thought that non-human animals were merely reflex machines, there is a serious body of psychological theory these days that says much the same thing about us. That is, that we are working on automatic pilot most of the time. We don't really think too much about what we're doing. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we want. We're basically simply operating on the basis of deeply ingrained habitual automatic uh, responses. I'll talk about that one last as a lead-in to the lecture series on, um, on uh, attention and automaticity. So let's, for the rest of the hour here, let's take a look at the first, the most conventional aspect of the mind-body problem, which is how you get from body to mind, uh, how, how it is that brains can generate, uh, generate consciousness. This is a problem that, um, that uh, Wittgenstein talked about um, in, the, uh, in the investigations. Or it's a, there's a feeling, there's an unbridgeable gap. This is the Cartesian idea. This is the James's conundrum. Wittgenstein knew perfectly well that brains cause consciousness. But even Wittgenstein couldn't get over the idea that somehow there's a difference, there's a gap between what goes on in the brain and what goes on uh, in the mind. This is supposed to be produced by a process in the brain, okay? And it amazed, uh, it amazed even him. This problem of what goes on in the brain to generate conscious experience 
is generally formulated these days in terms of what are known as the neural correlates of consciousness, a uh, phrase that we owe to uh, Christopher Koch, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a psychologist and neuroscientist at uh, Caltech. You had a question? Down here someplace? Oh, okay. Okay, and uh, what the neural correlates of consciousness problem is all about uh, is simply that there's, that there's some kind of covariance between what goes on in the body and what goes on in the mind. This is what Leibniz really wa had in mind when he talked about psychophysical parallelism, and it's what James had in mind when he embraced a kind of secular version of, psycho uh, of, of, of psychophysical parallelism. But the general idea here is that when you're conscious, something's going on in your brain that's not going on when you're not conscious. And the problem of the neural correlates of consciousness is to figure out what that is. So for each and every conscious event, there is a corresponding brain event. And the, the, the search for NCCs, they're called, wasn't that the beginning of the serial number of the ship on Star Trek, NCC? I think it was. Uh, anyway, uh, where in the brain do these events occur? If there's some isomorphism, some one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the, between what goes on in the brain and what goes on uh, in, in, the, in the mind, we ought to be able to figure that out. We got magnets, we got transcranial magnetic stimulation, we got PET scans, we got all this armamentarium of equipment now. We ought to be able to figure out where in the brain the, uh, the events occur that are, uh, that are associated with, uh, with consciousness. Or put another way, this is another uh, formulation from Koch, what are the minimal neuronal mechanisms jointly sufficient for any one specific uh, conscious uh, percept? Now, there have been a lot of speculations about this over the years. So, for example, famously, um, uh, Crick, the, uh, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, turned his attention to neuroscience uh, uh, some years before he died, um, worked with Koch, uh, arguing that the, the, what happens in the brain to generate consciousness is what they called synchronization at 40 cycles per second, or 40 hertz. What they argued was that in sensory cortex, you had neurons that were activated by various, uh, by, by various uh, um, sensory stimuli, and you might have one set of neurons that were associated with the shape of the stimulus, and another set of neurons that were associated with the color of the stimulus, and another set of neurons that were associated with the identity of the stimulus. And when these bundles of neurons all uh, were activated together, synchronized at 40 cycles per second, then you became conscious of the stimulus. If if, if there wasn't this uh, synchronization at 40, uh, 40 cycles per second, then you weren't conscious of the stimulus. This is the idea behind, uh, behind the neural correlates of, uh, of, uh, of consciousness. They also suggested that as an alternative, maybe there are in the brain, there's a set of what they called consciousness neurons. So you've got a set of neurons that are firing in response to some stimulus, and then you've got these neurons, these consciousness neurons that are firing. And when those two sets of neurons fire uh, in, in a synchronized fashion at 40 hertz, then you're conscious of the stimulus. But if they don't fire, uh, then you're not. Either way, we don't want to pursue the 40 hertz uh, section because Koch, uh, Koch himself has, has, has basically uh, abandoned uh, th this, uh, this idea. But it was a very famous idea for a, for, for a very long time. And it just gives you the, the, the essential feeling of what a neural correlate of consciousness uh, might, uh, might look like. Uh, Gerald Edelman and, um, and, and Tononi uh, uh, have, have a, a somewhat similar idea. Uh, Edelman has, uh, is a neuroscientist who's really interested in brain development. Um, and uh, he argues that uh, what, what happens in you, the consciousness arises when various uh, uh, aspects of neural activity occur in a particularly integrated and synchronized way. Again, you got this idea of synchronization uh, at, uh, at 40 hertz. We don't have to go into the details of this. You'll read all about it in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the Searle book. But um, uh, Edelman and Tononi have suggested that there's a particular system in the brain known as the thalamocortical system 
that is required for consciousness to occur. That is, um, here you've got a bunch of projections from the thalamus up into cerebral cortex. And if something, if those, if, if those projections are working the way they're supposed to, you're conscious. But if those projections are not working the way they're supposed to, uh, you're not conscious. So again, this thalamocortical system uh, it accounts as a kind of neural uh, correlate of consciousness. Yeah? Uh, it wasn't a, a, initially. It is now, okay, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but generally, uh, we know that the thalamus serves as a kind of sensory relay station. There are exceptions, but most, uh, most sensory uh, the processing fe is fed through, uh, uh, through the thalamus before, before it goes to uh, various cortical projection areas like A1 in the temporal lobe or V1 uh, in the occipital lobe. Uh, and so it just kind of made sense to them that the thalamus would be very important. So it was, mo it was more like a prediction. We now know uh, that, uh, th th that there's something to this. When you damage the thalamus, you're not conscious anymore. Okay, so there's a start. Okay, but at, at, the, at that moment, back in 2001, I don't think they actually knew that. I think they were basically trying to reason from brain structure. Uh, not unlike what, what uh, they did. He said, look, pineal gland is in the middle, right? And there's only one of it, uh, and, uh, and only humans have it. That's got to be where consciousness is. They basically said, look, you got this structure in the middle of the brain that projects to everything else. You know, it's got to be critical for this thing, okay? Um, now, what's going on here, uh, just to return to philosophy for a second, uh, if you're going to do this neural correlates of consciousness exercise, if you're going to start looking for what it is in the brain that's related to what's going on in people's minds, you're going to embrace one or another version of what our philosopher friends call identity theory. Okay? And um, the, the, uh, the search for the neural correlates of consciousness and the way Koch has framed the problem of the neural correlates of consciousness is basically inspired by this philosophical identity theory. And identity theory basically says, make a long story short, that mental states are identical to brain sta uh, to, 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 to neural states. Okay? So uh, it's like psychophysical parallelism, except even more, the brain state is the mental state. Okay? Uh, that's, uh, so you don't have uh, you're don't, not slipping into epiphenomenalism here. You're not saying the brain state is just kind of steam that's being given off by what's really going on, but that there is some kind of deep identity between what goes on in the brain and what goes on in the mind. Now, interestingly, and this is very interesting for those of you who are interested in neuroscience, um, some form of identity theory seems to underlie modern neuroscientific investigations. If you didn't embrace some version of identity theory, I think you wouldn't be doing uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive neuroscience at all. But it turns out that identity theory comes in two forms, type theory and token uh, identity theory. Okay? And they're different in important ways. The type theory, type identity theory says that mental states and brain states refer to the same thing. What that means in practice is, if I say to you, I want a hamburger, my brain is in a particular state. If you say to me, oh, I want a hamburger, your brain is in exactly the same state that my brain is in, okay? So there is a brain state that is the I want a hamburger state, okay? And that's different from the brain state that is, I want a Snickers bar. And if I say I want a Snickers bar, my brain is in a different state. And if you say you want a Snickers bar, then your brain is in exactly that state. Okay, now let me finish this. Now, token identity theory uh, is, is a little bit different. What token identity theory basically says is, when I say I want a hamburger, my brain is in a particular state. And every time I say, I want, a brain, I want a hamburger, my brain is in that state. But when you say, I want a hamburger, there's a state your brain is in, but it might be different from the state my brain is in when I say the same thing. 
Okay? So there's a brain state that's correlated with my saying I want a hamburger, and there's a brain state that's correlated with you saying I want a hamburger. Now notice what the implications are here for research. How do we identify the neural correlates of consciousness? To make a long story short, we put a subject into a brain scanner and we say, be conscious. <laughs> be conscious of something. You want to say something, you want to believe something, you want to desire something, you want to feel something, feel happy. And then we try to trace what state the person's brain is in when he or she is in that state. Now, the way neuroscientists do their work is they don't just work with one subject in one time, but rather they put a bunch of subjects through the same procedure. I go, through, I go into the magnet and I say, I want a hamburger, and you record what my brain is like, and then you go into the uh, uh, magnet and you say you want a hamburger. And we go, uh, what we do is we average across subjects. That methodology only makes sense if type identity theory is true. That methodology only makes sense if we assume that everybody's brain is in the same state when they have the same conscious state. But if we assumed that everybody's brain is in a different state when they have the same conscious state, okay, it wouldn't make any sense to do these kinds of studies because all you would get was noise. If you averaged across subjects, you'd get nothing. Okay? You just get, you, there, there would be no signal there. So modern neuroimaging studies of the neural correlates of consciousness, or for that matter, anywhere in cognitive, affective, behavioral neuroscience, assumes something like type identity theory, because it's only by virtue of something like type identity theory that you can, um, that you can generalize or average uh, results across subjects. So again, uh, there are some implications here. First, um, if you embrace type theory, then you might be able to do what the Churchlands want us to do, which is to abandon brain, uh, mental talk for brain talk. I could say to you, uh, my neurons in Broadman's area 15 are firing right now, and you know that that means I want a hamburger, or something like that, okay? But if it's Broadman's area 15 that fires when I want a hamburger, and Broadman's area 13 that fires when you want a hamburger, you can't do that, okay? You can't substitute brain talk for, uh, for mental talk, and this mental language is really the only coherent way we have of talking about behavior. So again, just because you got a lot of equipment doesn't mean you can escape entirely these philosophical uh, uh, discussions. Uh, in, in cognitive science, at the very least, the role of the philosopher is to ask the questions and check the answers, okay? Uh, so you've got, you got to make, make clear what the assumptions are underlying uh, what, people's, uh, what, what people's work is. Yeah? Um, why within token theory would it um, not acknowledge that it could be different when I say I want to get a hamburger? Well, token theory, oh, ah, all right. That's trouble, okay? If it's the case that your brain is in two different states on two different occasions when you say you want a hamburger, we'll never find out what the neural correlate of consciousness is. Because, again, we could run you until the cows come home. Time, to time after time after time after time, we'll average across the results. The best we can say is, on trial 17, your brain did this when you said that. Nobody in the world would accept that as a proper scientific uh, study because, for one thing, it's not generalizable. You can't do statistics on it. Uh, you can't do anything. We're looking for lawful regularities. So it's possible that every time you say you want a hamburger, your brain's in a particular state, and that's different from the, brain, from, from the state my brain is in. We could figure that out. We could stick you in a magnet and go through 50 trials, right, and say, look, area 13, right, that lights up every time she says she wants a hamburger, and we can call that your hamburger center, uh, or, 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 or something like that. Uh, but then if you put one, another subject in the, in, in, the, uh, in the machine, and a different area lights up, you put them together, you're going to get noise. So, yeah, they, tacitly, 
or not, uh, th these kinds of studies always make these kinds of um, uh, uh, assumptions. Otherwise, we couldn't generalize even from one subject. You, know, you just couldn't do it. Quick question. Yes, uh, it, if somebody has damage to a particular part of the brain that gives rise to a particular mental state, then they will not be able to have that mental state. So for example, patient HM has hippocampal damage. He, has very, he, ha, he can't remember things that have happened to him since his surgery. Couldn't, he's now deceased. Uh, but uh, when he was alive, he couldn't remember those. He couldn't have those mental states because he didn't have the biological, the, the brain apparatus that's important for creating those states. There's another patient, somebody who got into the news just the other day, famous uh, uh, patient, uh, patient SM. Uh, uh, the SM has a calcification of the amygdala that affects no other part of the medial temporal lobe of the brain. Doesn't hit the hippocampus, doesn't hit the perirhinal cortex, doesn't hit the hippocampal cortex, does, isn't in the temporal lobe. All she's got is nothing when it comes to the amygdala. She can't experience fear. Okay? So apparently, the amygdala generates these fear states, and if she doesn't have the amygdala, then she can't, ex she can't feel fear. Now, SM is interesting because she knows that things are dangerous. Okay, so she knows, well, it's like Mary the color scientist. She knows all about cobras, uh, and she knows all about walking against traffic and crossing uh, against uh, st stoplights and all that kind of stuff. But she just doesn't feel any fear. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I think that I think that is the implication that um, uh, though it's not completely clear. These guys, I mean, these guys haven't thought about that. that. That that's a really interesting thought, right? And that's one that I don't think anybody else has had. At least not. I've never had it. Um, but yeah, if it's the case that the activation of the amygdala is necessary for you to feel a particular kind of fear, then if your amygdala is gone, it's gone. And you can't have that. Maybe you can have some other kind of fear. So for example, this is what, this is what made, got S SM into the newspaper. Um, in a recent round of experiments, what, uh, what, what uh, a, a group of uh, uh, scientists at University of Iowa did was to uh, put a mask over SM's face and give her uh, an extra dose of carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, had to have her breathe higher levels of carbon dioxide than are normally in the atmosphere. That is something that will induce a panic attack in a normal person. Okay, don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> I just know somebody's gonna go home and get a bottle of carbon dioxide and do this. Don't do this, okay? Um, but, some, but that's what happens, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that SM felt the panic attack. And people are trying to go, well, geez, you know, we thought that you know, panic attack's a funny form of fear and the amygdala is the, center, is, is, is the fear center in the brain. Maybe there are two different fear centers for two different kinds of fear. Uh, these investigators, this is Tony DeMazio's group. Uh, DeMazio's not in Iowa anymore, but it's the same group. Um, uh, they're now are suggesting that maybe there is one brain center for externally generated fear. That's the amygdala. And maybe there's another brain center for internally generated fear, like what happens when you breathe more than your fair share of carbon dioxide. So, but that's how this goes. Okay, now we could take out that center too. I mean, maybe, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's the uh, olfactory epithelium or some damn thing. It doesn't matter what it is. If we could knock that one out, then she wouldn't feel that either. Okay, but that's the general idea. Okay, that's exactly right. 
So there is, again, that, I mean, that gets back to a psychological question, doesn't it? Are there different kinds of fear? And how would we know? We know, for example, I'm getting ahead of myself here, we know that there are different kinds of pain. And that those, all pain's not the same. Uh, there's uh, 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 fast pain and there's slow pain and there's suffering and there's sensory pain. Uh, and those seem to be mediated by different parts of the brain. Okay? Suffering seems to be mediated by frontal lobe structures, whereas uh, sensory pain seems to be mediated by uh, parietal lobe uh, uh, the structures. Um, uh, fast pain is mediated by A delta fibers, and slow pain is mediated by C fibers. Or is it the other way around? It doesn't matter for, this, uh, uh, for the purposes of, uh, uh, of this response. So you've got to be careful, again. But again, you know, the way you're careful is by doing the psychology carefully first. Once you know that there are several different kinds of, of, um, of uh, uh, the fear, for example, then you know you can, what to look for uh, in, the, in the brain. But if you don't know that to, be, uh, to begin with, you're, you're kind of lost. Yeah? Uh -huh. Theoretically, you should be able to uh, delete some portion, um, that would just negate hamburger. Uh, three minutes. Um, no, not necessarily. It all depends on how you think about the organization of the brain and how stuff is represented in the brain. If you're a traditional localist or lo locationist theorist, then it makes sense for you to search for a hamburger center in the brain, some cluster of neurons that fires inevitably whenever you want a hamburger. Okay? But if you're one of these guys who has a distributed view of the world, and you think about, say, a connectionist uh, model of hamburger desire, um, what, uh, uh, what, a, what, what a connectionist model would basically argue is that, you know, all these neurons are firing, but it's the pattern of neurons that makes the difference, not which neurons fire. Which neurons fire, that we can see easily, well, fairly easily, um, uh, with something like an MRI. But these distributed networks, they would be much harder to distinguish uh, from each other. Um, but either way, you would have a something like a, uh, a, a, a type identity theory. You just say, well, instead of this cluster of neurons here that's a hamburger center in the brain, what you've got is a pattern of activation across the entire cortex. And when that pattern of activation is instantiated, that's when you want a hamburger. So it, it cuts both ways. Okay, you, you've got to have, uh, again, you've got to kind of choose one model of brain representation as opposed to another. Okay, I'm going to make a long story short. For example, we talked about the thalamocortical things. We now know, for example, from studies of comatose patients, that the reticular system, let me just do this very fast, and then I'll let you go. There. The reticular system in the brainstem and the thalamus are very important for maintaining waking consciousness. If you've got damage to the reticular formation, you're, you're comatose. You are unconscious, and you don't go through anything like the normal sleep-wake cycle. But if your damage is to the thalamus, sparing the reticular uh, uh, the formation, that's what we generally think of as the persistent vegetative state, where you're unconscious, but you do go through the traditional sleep-wake cycle. This is the kind of thing that Edelman and Tononi, and especially now Tononi, uh, that has in mind when we try to identify the neural correlates of consciousness. Being conscious, being the state that you're in right now, requires one or both of those things to be intact and active. When they're not intact or they're not active, then you're not conscious in the way that you are now. That's how the search for the neural correlates of consciousness would go. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Next time, we'll look at the reverse psychosomatic and placebo effects.